Welcome to episode 466 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I am interviewing writer-director Katie White. She is a real smart filmmaker. She was able to get onto NCIS as a writer's assistant and then work her way up and got to write two episodes of the show. But she's really an indie writer-director, so now she's trying to make some indie films and get those produced. So we'll talk about her career, how she got onto NCIS, and now how she's trying to get these indie films going. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or listening or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast, and then just look for episode 406. 66. So a quick few words about what I've been working on. By the time this episode airs, we should have the contest, the screenplay contest and the film festival up and ready to accept submissions. You can find the screenplay contest on our website at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. And you can find the film festival at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash festival. And that festival link will just take you to our page on the film freeway page, which is where you'll actually make the submission. Once again, if you have a screenplay that you think could be produced on a low budget, definitely enter the contest. We've had some good success with our winning screenplays. Hopefully, you You've heard some of those podcast interviews from some of our winners and runner-ups. And if you have a low-budget film or short or feature, i definitely like to take a look at um, that through the festival. I'm doing something a little different this year with the festival. I'm really trying to figure out a way of giving the most value to filmmakers and kind of solve some of the, the frustrations that I had with film festivals. I'm trying to sort of save those. So what I'm going to do this, this year is I'm going to refund 100% of the entry fee to all the films that we do not accept. So if your film doesn't get accepted, we will issue a 100% refund for the entry fee, really trying to take a lot of the risk away from the filmmakers. Obviously, you still have to pay the entry fee if you get accepted, but we're going to screen all the films. Every film that gets um, into the festival, we're definitely going to screen it at a live in-person event here in Los Angeles. And um, if you, if we decide your film, for whatever reason, is not right for the festival, we'll give you a full refund on the submission fee. So there's really not a lot of risk to the filmmakers. Um, so anyways, that's what we're doing. And again, you can check out the contest selling your screenplay.com slash contest, or you can check out the film festival at selling your screenplay.com slash festival. I'm still working on the NFT project for the Rideshare Killer. I've actually got my first podcast interview where I'm being interviewed as a guest on an NFT podcast. Um, it's my first first one doing um, within the crypto space. And that's right now, that's my basically my strategy. I'm just building lists of NFT and crypto blogs and podcasts. And then I'm emailing those folks um, and just see kind of pitching my project and see if they might want to have me on as a guest. So, so far, I've got one email. Yes, I've probably sent um, maybe 55 emails so far. Um, I've got a list. I was able to buy a list. We'll see the quality of it for 100 bucks. I was able to buy this list of like 1,500 um, email addresses of NFT and crypto um, products. So I've got to go through that, make sure it's actually going to work. Um, but I'll start sending out that. And that's really, as I said, my main strategy for at least the first strategy is just going to be trying to hit the crypto community um, in their blogs, podcasts, and see. And it's, it's I'm sort of excited to see. Um, obviously, this is the film community. So I'm excited to see what they think of my project. But um, the crypto folks will have a very different view of it. Um, so again, I'm sort of excited to see how the crypto com community views what I've done with the Rideshare Killer in terms of my NFT project. Anyway, wish me luck. But those are some of the things that I've been working on over the last couple of weeks. Now let's get into the main segment. Today I am interviewing writer-director Katie White. Here is the interview. Welcome, Katie, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thank you so much for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Um, I grew up in New Jersey and I just kind of always wanted to write. I think I wrote a screenplay in middle school. Uh, I wrote a play that I then forced people to perform <laughs> yeah. for me. And that was kind of my, my shtick as a little kid. And then I went to college for a hot second and it wasn't for me and at the time the new york film academy had just opened and i believe it wasn't an accredited university yet it was just kind of a 
building mm-hmm. in New York with a shit ton of equipment. And I found my way there and kind of decided this was the industry for me. Okay. So talk about that. New York Film Academy. Um, I'm not someone that went to film school. Um, when, and when I ask people that come on the podcast, it's always kind of a mixed bag. Some people are real proponents. Yeah, it was a great experience. Some people like, yeah, it was a little expensive. What's your take on film school in general? And then specifically this, this one? Well, what was interesting was when I went there, we were very close to Tish, which, you know, is NYU's fancy, like mm-hmm. it looked like we were like on the wrong side of the tracks compared to them when we went to school there, because a, you weren't getting anything at, like you weren't getting a degree out of it when I went there. So you were just getting your experience, Mm -hmm. but also like we didn't study, we studied film, but we didn't study it to the degree you would at, you know, Tish. So within, I think like the first week of being there, we already had cameras in our hands and we're learning Mm -hmm. how to operate. They were teaching you how to work in the industry, how to work the equipment and how to make stuff. Whereas everybody from the other schools were going, well, our first year or second year was learning about like 1920s film yeah, and yeah. The, the French new school. wave. Yeah, I got you. So it's hard because <laughs> I'll go to, I'll never forget. I took a short film to a film festival and the night before all these directors were sitting together and they were all just waxing poetic about, you know, well, my, my biggest influence was so-and-so from this era and every name was going straight over my head. And I was mm-hmm. like, I, I can't play that game. I was like, but I can tell you that we shot mine. That's in the same world as yours in 48 hours for under a thousand dollars. And we're in the same film festival you are because we had just a different type of skill sets. We couldn't talk about the history of film, but we could bang one out and know what worked Mm -hmm. and know what didn't and kind of play every role because that's what we were taught. Mm -hmm. But now I do have to say now the film Academy, the New York film Academy has expanded like to a amazing, like now you can get the full history education. You can do so much Mm -hmm. more than was available when I went, I believe I was in like the first generation of it, Hmm. but still it was, I loved that we showed up and it was just a bunch of really creative people taught how to use equipment and given this freedom, like they would have subjects and, you know, different types styles that we had to do, but it was like the freedom to just go and just Mm -hmm. make shit and to be there 24 hours a day to edit in this dark cave. And it was just this feeling of being in like just the wild of creativity. And it was really Mm -hmm. awesome. So I hope that it still has that kind of a vibe nowadays. It's been probably God, at least 25 years. Hmm. Maybe a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Okay. So then once you, once you were done with that, it sounds like you had a bunch of films, at least under your belt. Um, what was your next step to actually turning this into a career? Well, what was funny was that was one of the spots that I don't think at the time they had the capacity to help you with like that. Was, I actually don't think any school does that correctly. Even high school, you leave it and they're like, mm-hmm. good luck. And you're like, wait, what the hell happens next? Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I don't think anybody really prepares you for the next step the way that they could. Um, and I was dealing with a couple of different family issues. So I kind of went home and I worked on a few independent films that were shooting in New Jersey or Philadelphia and kind of did any job people would hire me for, but I couldn't figure out the how to get from where I was to LA to do what I wanted to do. I had no idea, like absolutely no concept how to do that. And I believe it took me like eight years before I was like, okay, I just have to go and do it. And cause I drove out here when we were in the writer strike. <laughs> so when I drove out and I was like, I'm going to break in and I got out here and they were like, nobody's breaking anything. The writer <laughs> striked. And I was like, Oh shit. Um, so yeah, I definitely did not have a direct pathway and that's the one thing is every, every once in a while I'll meet somebody who goes like, well, an alumni from my school helped me get this. And I'm like, ah, oh, shit, that's why the big universities, mm-hmm. you know, are useful. And even now, like I know the film Academy has a much bigger wealth of outlets for people, but when I was there, it was, you know, that wasn't a thing yet. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I came out here and was like, I'm going to make my film career. It's going to happen right away. And I think it was a decade before I worked in television. Okay. So let's talk about that. I just, I love to ask these questions because I know there's people listening to this podcast that would love to make this transition. Obviously it sounds like you came out in 2008. That was the writer's strike around that time. So just give us some, some advice, like how much money did you save? Who did you know? How did you actually make that transition? Are there some locations in LA? When I came out here, it was before that. And the, 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 the advice I got was that studio city, North Hollywood area was centrally located. It was decently priced. It's in the Valley, but give us that 
same sort of thing. What did you do? How much money did you save? How did you just logistically make that transition? What did you tell your family? Hey, I'm going to Hollywood to be a screenwriter. You know, wish me luck. What do you tell tell people? How do you kind of get past all of those hurdles? Well, that's really funny because I was told the same thing. You go to the Valley. Mm -hmm. Um, And I literally went there and like planted myself down. I was there for 12 years before I left it going like there's more to the LA. (laughs) Like You can (laughs) see other places too. But um, I'm extremely lucky that my parents were helpful financially. Although they, my father was not excited. Like he did not like this decision. Um, And I think they thought I would be back in like an hour, which I, for the first couple of years, Mm -hmm. my keys were in my hand a lot of being like, I'm going to go. Like when I first moved out here, there was this really weird, like scam job going on where movers would move your, would offer you a rate. And then once they started traveling, they'd say, well, we went to a way station. It was too heavy. You now owe us a thousand dollars more and things of that nature. So when I got out here, they pulled that scam on me and I did had no money. Like I was, I had just enough to get me through like a year of being in LA. And I knew a thousand dollars out of that was just Mm -hmm. already in a downhill spiral. And I'll never forget. I had all the, all I had was my dog and what I could fit in my car. And I was in this rat infested apartment in Sherman Oaks. And I was sitting there and I was like, what, what did I do? I have no furniture. I was sitting in a target bath mat that I bought. And my sister being wonderful sent me like, I would say probably two to three weeks worth of food, stuff you could freeze all this stuff. But I wasn't, I was too scared to tell my family, A, I think I fucked up and B, I have nothing. I have no furniture. I don't. And then I was like, I don't even have a refrigerator because I didn't realize that in California, that's a thing where like you bring your own refrigerator to an Mm -hmm. apartment in Philadelphia. That's not, it comes with the place. So she sent me all this food. And I remember laying on the, on a bath mat, eating it with my fingers because I didn't even have utensils. And finally, like a week later, I think it was my dad was like, are you actually okay? Because we don't think you are. We think you're pretending you are. And I was like, yeah, I'm pretending. And he was like, what's happening? And thankfully he was like, I will get your furniture to you. I will pay them. Like, you know, we'll get you past that. Mm -hmm. And he was like, or turn around and come home. And I won't pretend it wasn't one of the most inviting things Mm -hmm. I've ever heard was turn around and come home. And I think for the first couple of years, that was a really inviting thing because LA is a very different city. It's once you get submerged in it, it's very easy to be home. But I'm from the East Coast where people are nosy, they're in your business. And LA, it's the, it can feel very lonely because mm-hmm. nobody's going to go out of their way to be in your business, which is great. But mm-hmm. when you're used to that, it feels very, you feel very just isolated. Um, so I think it was a really terrifying time. And I took every job under the sun that I could find. And I was a nanny. I was selling sex toys. I was managing pl- places I had no right to be managing. Like I was just kind of mm-hmm. doing anything anywhere. And that's another thing too, is like, there's nothing worse than calling your family and saying like, Hey, I got a job managing a sex store. And they were like, what? And they were, and they were like, please come home. And then I got fired from that job. And then I, that's even worse. My dad was like, you got fired from selling porn. I was like, I did. I got fired from selling porn. So, you know, you have, you have to expect some lows, but also it gives you a ton of ah! to write about. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, no kidding. Okay, so so take us through. You're you're working yeah. these jobs to get through. What were you doing on the writing front? You were writing a bunch of specs. You were sending them out. You were going to networking events. What were you doing during those first few years? I couldn't find my way. I still can't find my way into like net. Like now, because of Twitter, I can find my way into networking events where it's like at a bar, you know, that where they're just having a meetup, but. God, like 15 years ago, there wasn't a Twitter where you could find these things. I had no idea how to get into a networking event if like my life depended on it. What I knew was, I don't even, I'm sure it's still a website, but there was like mandy.com was a website back then that people use for jobs. But there was also a couple that told you what film festivals and things of that Mm. and like screenplay festivals. So I knew I could spend a certain amount of money to send my scripts out there. So that was kind of my thing was I would just send things out and enter things and see how they do. And then anything I got into, I went to and I kind of made a meal out of that. And then I think it was probably 10 or 11 years ago that I shot my first short film. And I was and that was a great experience for me because we took that to probably like six or seven small film festivals, but they were film festivals 
this is a weird tangent, but I like to tell anybody making a short film and people think I'm an asshole for this, but I'm like, hey, if you're writing a Sundance short film, more power to you. But also maybe know what you have and look at the lower level film festivals because you're going to meet your kind of like your graduating class. Like you're going to meet your equals. Mm -hmm. And the best thing I ever did was find my equals and start working together and start kind of like, so at this point now, all of my friends who 10 years ago were entering the same festivals I'm entering. Now one of them sold her first TV show. And one of them is, you know, an award-winning editor. And it's like, you got to find your graduating class and kind of move up with them Mm -hmm. because it's the easiest way to have shoulders to lean on and to have people to work with. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about those shorts just quickly. How did you put those together? You had enough experience just through this film school that you knew how to direct, you knew sort of the logistic of stuff. How did you get a crew? How did you get a budget to get these done? It was all friends. And my first one my first short film we made, including all of the entry fees to festivals and everything, we made it for a thousand dollars, which is, I'm still shocked that we were able to pull that off. And it was just the fact that it was really simple and sweet and would take two days to shoot. And a friend of mine at the time was renting a house and she wanted to be in it. And it was kind of, okay, so you'll star in this and we'll utilize your house and we'll just make this room this. And then a friend of mine's husband has been like a grip for 20 some years. And he was like, well, if you wait until I'm on hiatus, I'll work for two days. He's like, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, and I'll ask a buddy from work if he'll do it for two days. You know, it was one of those things where you kind of get your, your group of people who go like, oh, I, I can give you two days of my life, you know? Mm -hmm. And we kept it. We were really good about like, we weren't going to do any crazy hours. We're going to feed people well and Mm -hmm. just make it so that nobody, the worst is if you go to a short film shooting and it's like a bad situation and you're like, I'm here for free. Like I'm here a favor or I'm here for like the smallest amount of money and you handed me cold pizza. Like, so like I made, we made sure to be really to shoot something that would be easy to shoot logistically. And that just really was a character driven story. Um, And we had such a great time doing it that everybody was so happy, not only with the product, but with just the experience that after that, it was like, Hey, next, next time you're working on something, let me know. So it really was just appreciating everybody there that helped Mm -hmm. me continue to make things like that because we made it a pleasant environment. And like, and I think it was the biggest lesson too, that I brought into going into a writer's room is um, like, the truth is you're just stuck in a room with people. You're stuck on set with people for a very long time. And if people, if you're tough to work with, or if you have an ego, or if you just don't get along well with people or can't try to get along well with people, nobody's going to want you there, Mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. So at this point, as you're doing your short, what is the direction of your career you're trying to go in? You want to do features? You want to be a writer, director of features? Or were you starting to sort of gravitate towards TV? Were you writing spec TV episodes? And we're sort of gearing up because I'm going to the next question, of course, is how did you become you know, a writer's assistant and ultimately write those two scripts on NCIS? But just where where are you just in this point when you do your short? Where are you in your career writing wise? Well, what's interesting is when I went to film school, um, TV was dead. Like TV was the place that like no celebrity wanted to have a TV show. So the whole thing was like, you got to write features, you got to write features. And I came out here as it was transitioning to like that's a cool feature, but like, I'm really into TV now. And I was like, shit. So I came out here with a wealth of features and that was kind of the direction I was going to go in. And I had a feature that we, gosh, we had, you know, come together and fall apart probably at this point, like 15 times in the last Mm -hmm. decade. Um, And we, even to the point where one of the producers that I've worked with for eight or nine years on it, sudden, like tragically passed away. And we've had all of these really gigantic hurdles with it where the other producer and I just a few months ago kind of reconvened and said like, we're going to do this. We have no, I I could be 85 when we get this off the ground. Like I have a photo behind me that is actually of the day that Jean Smart told me she would be in it, which was wonderful. And it was like the highlight of my life. And then we immediately found out one of the investors was bullshit, had no money. And suddenly everything fell apart again. So it's like, we've done all the highs and lows of every aspect of this film. And I still am a huge proponent of indie film. And I think the greatest realization I had though, was that my heart is in an indie film 
And to ever get one off the ground, I need to be working in some other aspect of either the industry or something because you're never going to eat well mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. in the film. And I like to eat. So, yeah. Gotcha. So then let's talk about then your your career with NCIS. Um, just talk about that. How did you then make the transition? How did you get that first job as right? So was that the first job with NCIS? It was my first job. Like I worked as a PA on tons of different things, but nothing big enough to kind of launch me into anything. And also I was never a writer's PA. And that's always hard mm-hmm. because then, you know, people go, oh, you can make that shift from like production PA to I've never, I've never figured out how to do it. I I know people that have, but it was not in my skill set. Um, so I I always say that I got my job, which the showrunner has disagreed with me on this, but I say I got the job from half nepotism, half talent, because he was asked by a family member who knew him through something else if he would have lunch with me and talk to me about the industry. And at the time they weren't hiring for anything, but I had a script that had been doing really well. And I kind of knew I had an ace up my sleeve and he asked if he could read. He said, you know, I'll give you notes on something. And it was also just a really great lunch. He'd been in the industry his, you know, whole career. And he was in his six, like late sixties. And it was just a very interesting lunch of somebody telling me the world of their story. And then I kind of knew I had an ace up my sleeve with the script. And when I sent it to him, he was like, okay, like, he's like, we don't have a staff position, but I can offer you this writer's assistant position if you, if you are willing to do that. And I didn't know even what a writer's assistant really was at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I mean, it's my first foot in, I'm going to take it. And that was how I got in. Okay. So, so let's take a step back and, and, and talk about that. What does a writer's assistant do? What is that position actually entail? I just think the assistant part's not, which you are an assistant, but I always think of an assistant as the person, you know, scheduling your, your calls and your meetings and stuff. And a writer's assistant is you're in the room and you're taking all the notes and you're you're making sure that everything that's said in that room is known to everybody and is put in a logical order because you're in a room of a, a lot of creative people, sometimes speaking at the same time, all trying to break episodes and break characters and figure out where the show is going to go. The I think the hardest thing about the the not that it should be a career it should be a stepping stone but the career of a writer's assistant is it completely depends on the room on, on the show and on the room mm. you know i worked on ncis which is right now on their 20th season mm. that is a well oiled machine that mm. is a, like that is completely different than if i had worked in a room that was breaking a pilot episode where every character is brand new and you're creating these worlds and this like on ncis some of the writers had been there for they were so seasoned that it was like Hey, your episode number four. And they're like, cool, gotcha. I'll come back when I have something. And like they were given that freedom for good reason because they track mm-hmm. records that prove they could do that. So then they would come back in with a with an outline or like with an idea, like you know, at least like a, a broken down concept. Whereas I have friends who've been writers' assistants on brand new shows, and their experience was just so different because they're they'd spend days creating a character, or creating, mm-hmm. you know, what will this world look like? What will the house look like? But we had I could go downstairs to the mm-hmm. set and see what everything looked like. So it was a much, so it really is dependent on who you work for and what the vibe is of the room. Some rooms as a writer's assistant, you don't say anything. You sit there quietly and you learn in some rooms, they want you to speak up and they want your opinion. So it really is bizarrely different on every show, but it is a stepping stone to being a staff writer. So how many writers are in this writer's room? Correct me if I'm wrong. NCIS, it's an hour long. Is there 22 episodes a season still? So that's a lot of actual per yeah. content. Um, how many writers are there and how many assistants are covering? Are, are there just one assistant per room? Well, there were there were two when I was there, but what they did was kind of interesting, which a lot of people are doing now is there, there was no writer's PA. So there were two writer's assistants and then we swapped off every other episode. I would do the PA work and she would do the writer's assistant work. And then- at one point, we just got in such a mull that we were both doing it all together because she and I, I lucked out that she became like, we met and we were like, oh, we're basically best friends now. So we, we lucked out with personalities mm-hmm. that we just got along great. So we kind of just combined, we figured out what everybody's best skill sets are because like I am, as a writer's assistant, the scariest thing for me is I uh, am neurodivergent and I have a disability where I'm extremely dyslexic. So the first time they were like, well, can you go write on the board? I was like, 
no, like you don't want me to because you're not going to have any idea what I'm writing. Like the words won't make sense. So I was very lucky that she was like, I will gladly write on the board because I don't like doing this side of the job. And I was like, well, I'll do that. You do this. So I was very lucky because Mm -hmm. that was also a a hill to climb was saying like, hi, I'm your writer's assistant. And one of the main aspects of this job is reading and writing. And I'm disabled and struggle with that. Gotcha. (laughs) So how many many writers are, are on something like NCIS? Staff on writers. NCIS, I believe there were like, oh, nine, maybe trying to count offices. Yeah, I yeah. Think so, just roughly. Was, I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, but there, I think like eight or nine, but there was so many, you know, so many episodes and something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, probably more like eight, but, um, but yeah. And then there were, uh, but I know, you know, nowadays with the much smaller rooms, I think because there's just shorter episode runs and that's kind of a direction TV has gone in. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think there is ever. There's no. also to have 22 to 24 episodes a season is, you know, wild these days. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I mean, I wish more shows had that, but it's, mm-hmm. it's like, it's like a dinosaur. Yeah. So what is just, just break down the hierarchy from, so there's the showrunner at the top. There's the writer assistant at the bottom. What, what in the writer's room, what is the hierarchy of titles? There's a staff writer and executive producer and this just sort of break down sort of that hierarchy a little bit. The problem is I probably won't do it correctly. There is mm. <laughs> above a above a writer's assistant is a staff writer, and then it's story editor, and then from there on, it gets to be murky with me because there's like producer, co-producer, executive producer, but it's I don't know, mm-hmm. I don't know if co-producer happens before producer. I don't know. If, I know there's like a there's something in between those two. It's a it's a murky world in that. Mm-hmm. And what does the week look like for you guys? Do you show up on Monday and you get in a room and you start pitching around ideas for the episodes? Um, How many hours are spent in this writer's room as a group? And then the writers, I assume they get time to go off and actually write their episodes. What are you guys doing as the assistants during that time? So, um, and I can only speak to NCIS, which was probably working on it was one of the greatest experiences just to see just to watch, like I've said before, it's a well-oiled machine, but we would start in June and try to have, you know, probably five episodes or four episodes written, or at least, you know, a shell of it written or an outline written before we started production. Cause that was the other thing is we shot every eight days, they shot a new, you know, episode Mm -hmm. kind of Mm -hmm. throughout the season. So in the beginning we have kind of, you know, a wealth of like, the first five done, hopefully. And then once we start shooting, it's, you start to get like, by the end of it, you're rewriting as you're like going to set kind of. And, but it was fascinating because prior to COVID we worked right above the stages. So I could go downstairs and watch them film things. I could, you know, it was a really wonderful environment. If you're like me, where I really love to direct and like, I love being on set and I love that environment. So it was really lovely to be, to experience that but also to watch these people who have done this for some of them have been there since like NCIS is technically a JAG spinoff. And there's crew members who have been there since JAG, which is just shocking to Mm -hmm. me. So as one of my favorite aspects of it was everybody thought I was super young, which I'm, I was one of the oldest writer's assistants that I've ever met at, I got the job at 36 and I left it weeks before my 40th birthday. Um, But everybody on set was like, 60 something. So they all thought I was this young whippersnapper, which I always thought was hilarious. <laughs> Our writer's room really just depended on, on who was doing what, you know, some writers needed an audience to kind of go through all their thoughts process with some writers would be like, just leave me alone. Let me go do this. And I think because of the longevity of the show and how long everybody had been there, they really had a freedom to be like, this is how I work best. Let's do it this way for my episode. And then somebody else would say, well, I need you guys. Um, but they tended to do little mini rooms too, where somebody would go like, can I pull two or three people in and just bounce something for this scene off of them? Um, which I do believe from my experience kind of does work better because when you get too many cooks in the kitchen, mm-hmm. it's just, it's interesting. And the other funny thing is it's it's very easy to derail 10 people, you know, mostly when it's like, like 1130 and lunchtime's coming up and all it takes is one person to go like, Oh, did you guys see that thing that came up? And it's like, no, 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 no guys, get back, get back to your, what you're talking about, you know, like get back on track. So I think that's, that's just kind of how it worked there. Um, when they weren't, I was lucky at NCIS because the note taking was not 
some writers needed more than others, but most writers didn't need copious, copious hours of my time. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wrote a lot, I wrote a ton of stuff while I was there and just kind of, you know, worked that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, now the, 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 you know, $64 million question, how do you make that transition from writer assistant to actually getting on and writing some of these episodes? And, you know, in the context of, you know, not being annoying, obviously everybody knows that the writer's assistants are there because they want to be writers. So how do you do it in a non annoying, non, you know, pushy way, um, but still start, start to let them know, Hey, I want to write an episode. Well, a couple things. Um, I've I've yet to make the leap from writer's assistant to staff writer. I've never been staffed. I got two freelance episodes. Um, I will say that I was given, I think my first season there, I was given some of the worst advice I've ever been given, which I like to share with people because it was, I was with a new management company. I had two managers who really were going to hit the ground running and I was extremely excited. And they said, we would like you to write a spec episode of the show. And I said, okay. And they said, write it of the show. And then kind of, you know, you know, one of these, there were two showrunners at the time. They said, you know, one of the showrunners, like just get his notes on it. And their theory was then they could go to other procedural TV shows and say, Hey, she's the writer's assistant. Here's a sample of her writing in the same vein of what you do. Like, would you consider staffing her? And at the time in that mindset, I was like, this is a good idea. But once I saw the reaction, reality kind of hit of like, oh, that is something you never do. Like you never write an episode of the show that you're on and just ask people to let you know if you hit the mark or not. That was a very humbling moment in my life. And why not? Why don't you do that? Because there's a lot of egos in a room and, uh, I think the description I was given was like that I looked like an I looked like an asshole. I looked like somebody who thought I was bigger than what I was and I looked like I was expecting it just was it was presumptuous. Mm-hmm. And the one thing you don't want to be in a, as a writer's assistant is presumptuous to anything. It's very weird. It's a role that I struggled with because mostly at the age I got it, I was kind of past pledging a sorority. You know, I was past the age where I was like, I'm willing to, like, I was still willing to pay my dues. But when you're 20, you're willing to pay much different dues than when you're 36, 37. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, they're completely different levels of what you're willing to do. And I feel like it is a job where for so many generations, the expectations of it have been that kind of, you know, whenever the show needs you, you're there no matter what time or day. And, I feel like I was lucky on NCIS because I've heard stories from other people where I go like, I would have gone home at midnight. Like I wouldn't have done that till 2 a.m. So like I hear these stories and go like, I wouldn't have survived that way. But it is also a room of, there's a lot of egos and you come in with an ego yourself. And it's, it's just a tough, it's tough to navigate it. And it's funny because I told a group of writers that the other day. And when I told, when I was telling the story of like, so I wrote a spec and I went to the upper level writers and asked them to read it. The look, like the color draining from people's faces, just because they know that if you hit the one writer who's got an ego problem and thinks that they're kind of a God, you're screwed. Like you just blacklisted yourself from anything they ever did. So it's just, it's a complicated world of, it's tough. It's it's a job where when you get into the WGA, they I, they tell you something, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's like you have a better chance of getting drafted to Major League Baseball than you do of getting into the WGA. Something mm-hmm. ridiculous like that, where you go, oh shit, like there, this is something people want so badly. You you got this. That's awesome. Now, like, what the hell are you gonna do with it? And I feel like sometimes that doesn't create a very inviting environment, and other times it does. But it was a, it was a very, it was looked at as a very cocky move on my part. And I can see that. Yeah. And so what is the, the right move to write a spec of a similar show, but not the same show or to write maybe a, 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 sh- a pilot episode for a show that's similar, um, but not the same show. What is the answer? The answer when it comes to being staffed on a different show do well, no, know? just, just from your you manager's perspective. I mean, I understand what your managers, they were trying yeah. to, you know, they were trying to launch your career and they thought this was a viable thing. So what is that advice now to someone else in your position? Um, what what My should they do? My advice would be to be writing, 
um, either a spec of another show or an original pilot. And then when people have downtime at work, everybody's going to know that you're a writer. Every, everybody knows you want to be st- a staff writer because a staff writer will make you, will get you into WGA, which is just, it's health insurance. It's a, it's a different level of mm-hmm. life. And, and granted now, I think the year I began as a writer's assistant was the first year that there was what's 871, a union that covers writer's assistance, which has been life-changing for that experience. But it's, you know, the WGA is the goal because it's protection, it's other opportunities and whatnot. Um, so nobody ever thinks that you don't want to write an episode. So you don't have to worry about people assuming that you don't or thinking mm-hmm. that you don't. They know it's actually all you think about all day long. So you hope for moments where they say like where you can chime in. You hope for moments where there and there's always somebody in the room who will see that in you and who will take, you know, there's always that good writer who looks over and goes like, hey, what would you do kind of a thing? And you can tell that they're doing it because somebody once did that for them and they got to have a voice, um, which is so interesting and important in a room is to, to realize that, you know, everybody has an opinion and a voice. And like, even the writer's assistant or, P- or PA could have, you know, a great idea and why not ask it? So I think that was, you know, a good, a good spot to start. But I also, when I started there, I was honest about how, like, you know, I was, I was a writer and I was writing things and that was important. And the showrunner said basically right off the bat, like we can't offer you an episode this season, but hopefully next season we can like, let's see how it goes. Um, and it kind of just, that was how it worked, which, cause I think they knew that. And I do think my, I feel like my age might have helped in that direction just because they knew that it, I wasn't straight out of college. I wasn't 20 and I didn't have 10 years to put my to pay my dues on something Mm -hmm. I had, you know, I was pretty much ready to go. And so that's ultimately how it happened. Then the second year they said, we have an episode and we'll, we'll assign it to you. Yeah. The second year. Um, and I believe I had just gotten in the semifinals of the nickel for like the second time. Um, so that was, you know, that things like that helped. Mm -hmm. I was always doing that on the outside too. I was always entering festivals And my short film had another short film had gone to festivals and stuff. And that it's very easy for then people come in and go like, Oh my God, congratulations. And somebody else is like, what are they congratulating you for? And you're like, Oh, I got into this festival. And it puts people go, okay, this person's working Mm -hmm. because the other thing that you have to think of is like, people really love to be like, Oh, you know, we discovered that person. That's people's that's Hollywood's favorite sentence is like, Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I, I gave that person their first break. They love that. So if they know you're busting your ass, you're applying to things, you're entering festivals and you're doing well outside, if they, if you get a new manager, you make sure that somebody there knows like, oh, I'm having a great day. I got a new manager today. And people go, oh shit, like that manager wants to work with this person. What do we have in our hands? Mm-hmm. So um, I think that I'd had, you know, the nickel was a big one. I think I was in like the top 50 or hundred of the nickel or something like that, that year, I think it was 50 that year. And it was just one of those things where they were like, oh shit, like. And then one of the showrunners said, can I read your nickel script? And that was, that went over really well. So I think it's, you know, letting them know that you are, even as their assistant, you're still working, you're still a writer first. Mm -hmm. This is just your paycheck. I think it's important because then they realize that they might be sitting on a talent they don't really know about. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? Okay. So they've decided, okay, we're going to let the assistant write one episode. Um, Do they give you a premise? Do they say, go come up with some premises and come and pitch those? How does it actually come, come about? I think it's, I mean, it completely depends on the show, but for NCIS, it's a procedural. So we aren't following, you know, the same storylines every episode, which is, so it gives you more it gives you more freedom in a way, but also it's a little bit, I would say like, for me, I realized that I would probably have been more comfortable on a show that was serialized where they would say like, this is the trajectory of these three characters, because then it's kind of a little bit more of a, of a map. Whereas Mm -hmm. with procedural, something I had to learn to be comfortable with is kind of the freedom of saying like, okay, here are our main characters, but there's this big crime. That's going to, that's the whole episode what's that? And how do you Mm -hmm. make that these characters fit into that? And how do you give everybody their own voice in that? And, um, I think that I believe my first episode, they had us come up because the other writer's assistant got one as well. And I believe they had us come up with like three different ideas and kind of have just a loose idea of what the episode would be like. And we had to know kind of the crime. And I believe they called it the arena. Do you have an arena for this? Which for some reason that word fucked with my head so badly, I never knew what they were talking about. But um, 
But I think that we did that. And we kind of had like three ideas and they told us the one that worked the best. And then, you know, we had to kind of come up with a board for ourselves and then they would send in different groups of writers to kind of go through our board and say like, well, the worst is when somebody would go, well, your second beat, like all they would do is A, B, C, and D. And you're like, well, there goes the episode. You know, somebody would pull that little thread and the whole mm-hmm. thing would unravel, but it was great because then you got to rebuild it with other people. And some days you left work feeling like you were on top of the world. And other days you left work being like, I'm a hack, I'm an idiot. But the best part of working on a TV show is you see people with like five more, 10 more years of experience than you leaving some days thinking they're brilliant and some days thinking they're an idiot and a hack. And you're like, oh, this is just being a writer. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. So then what is the, the, yeah. So you mentioned a little bit, there's, you're getting the other writers in there to, to pin holes on it. Um, But just in general, I'm curious, what does the development of one of these scripts look like? Um, Do you guys read it? Do you have table reads with NCIS? You're still doing rights. And then even a step back on that, do you do like table reads with just the writers um, and give notes that, or is it more the showrunner is sort of managing all of these scripts? And sometimes you do, if he thinks the script needs a polish, you do a polish, you know, you do some of this stuff. Um, It depends. My first, my first episode was with two showrunners and then one retired. So my first and second episode were run really differently. Whereas my first one was very, felt very collaborative. And there were a lot of times of people coming in and sitting down and going through my board with me and really making sure that I had this, you know, that this worked. And then there's so many different steps. Like you go from, you have a board and then once your board's approved, then you write a one pager and then your one pager has to be approved by the showrunners. And then that goes to the network because you also have a bigger boss than the showrunners Mm -hmm. and the network has to prove that. And then you go to your outline and then your outline, you know, you send that out and the other writers give you notes on that. And then the showrunners give you notes on that. And then you redo that. And then you, that outline goes to the network and then the network gives you notes on that. So it's a lot of like, every time you go like, okay, this is working. Like, this is good. Somebody will go, I don't know about this. Or like, I'm not. And you're like, shit. And it's a lot of these like ebbs and flows of just like realizing how much more work you have ahead of you, Mm -hmm. I think. Um, And one of the best things, my first episode was so personal to me. And so like, not the story, just that it was my first episode of TV. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest notes I got was somebody very early on was like, this is a great idea. You did a great job. If you're working for HBO, like, what are you doing? And I was like, what? They're like, but you're on it. Like you're in a CBS show. You're at this time. And it was like, oh, like this, when you're on a TV show, it is not let me shine. It's let me figure out how to make an episode of this show. And I think because I was kind of, I had an idea, it got greenlit. And then I kind of had the freedom to go write it, a lot of it on my own. I came back and I realized that on my own, I'd gone off topic. Mm -hmm. I'd gone off to off tone more, Mm -hmm. Um, which wasn't, it was not an easy, it was an easy fix when it came down to it, but it was a very great lesson to learn that like sometimes because there wasn't, there weren't like, barriers that we had, you know, so that we had so much freedom that sometimes too much freedom when you're not, you know, schooled in that world enough is too much freedom, I think, you know? Yeah. I'm curious how, you know, there's sort of a general perception that the development executive, the, the, the network executives give really lame notes. Oh, you know, they're just pushing these down versus you maybe a showrunner, another writer, they give you more, you know, writery type notes, but how did you find that um, the difference in the notes and were the executive notes um, sort of what we would expect more logistical stuff? Oh, you know, just compare them a little bit. What was your, your impression of these things? Um, I really think it's, I think it was, it was interesting. Cause I think it is really to each their own. Like there were people where I would, cause a lot, you know, the other writers give you a heads up too. They'll go like, Oh, listen, like so-and-so is going to give you notes. Don't freak out. They might seem harsh. And then I would get those notes and I tend to like when people are just blunt. So I get those notes and go like, Oh, that's so useful that you were just like, that's not working. This is weird. Whereas other people would get that and feel like, I just think it was completely dependent on the writer. Cause I, you know, there were people in the network that people were like, oh, I don't know. Like, they're not going to, they're going to kind of give you lofty notes. And I was like, well, that note was great. Or there were people that everybody was like, this person's notes will be life-changing. And I was like, I didn't get it. So like, I feel like Hmm. sometimes it was just the person because also it was interesting at the same, to do it at the same time as my friend and the other writer's assistant, we were kind of doing it within the same three month period of time. So it was so funny to see how each of us had a different 
preference of who to go to for notes or who to go to when uh, something wasn't working, you know, whose brain to pick. We had different people because we were such different personalities. So I really think it's, you know, like every once in a while you would get a note from an exec that is kind of just like a sound effect where it's like this scene, um, hmm. And then you just freak out because you have no idea what that means. But I think it was stepping back and, and realizing that like the note behind that sound effect, it, you know, they always say, look for the note behind the note. The note behind that sound effect is that something's work not working, but nobody can put their finger on what it is. And that's a note. Like that is mm -hmm. as much as it sucks to get a sound effect because you want it, you, you go like, well, I don't know what to do with that. Once you calm down and, and look at it, you go, okay, there's something wor not working here that nobody can seem to put into words, but that's still something that you need to figure out. Um, mm -hmm. Or yeah, or you would get the note that was like, hey, that's going to cost a fortune. And you go like, because sometimes you forget, <laughs> you, you write, you know, to your imagination. And then somebody looks at you who has to do the logistics of that. And they go like, like, what, like, what are you doing? And you're like, oh, we can't have the world explode. Like, really? <laughs> so, you know, so every, and like, you hate to get that note too. The note where they go like, my first episode took place in a downpouring storm. And I feel like it was my like second production meeting, very close when we were going to shoot. And one of the producers looked over and was like, oh, by the way, there's no rain. And he was like, do you know what that would cost us? And I was like, shit, okay. And it was just, you know, mm -hmm. one of those things where I was like, I didn't think about that. I Cinematically, this was dreamy and pretty. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, yeah, what do you like? And then they were like, do you want to make everybody wet for eight straight days? You want to deal with those actors? And I was like, that's a, because that's another thing you got to think about yeah. is like, you're dealing with people who, we had one thing during this summer and it was, you know, it's California and they're in the middle of Santa Clarita. It's hot as hell out there. And these actors are outside and they're in tactical gear and they're out there for days. And the look on their faces is like, you guys couldn't have made this like during winter, like this couldn't have switched mm -hmm. spots. So there's a lot of moving factors that you've got to remember is like, you're doing this to another human being who is technically your coworker. Like you don't mm -hmm. get to leave the set and never see them again. You're going to see them at lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and make, and that's, that's such yeah. an excellent point. And I'll often watch these movies that take place. Like what was the Leonardo DiCaprio one a couple of years where he's out in the snow? I'm sitting there yeah. thinking this is a brilliant movie, but I sure wouldn't want to have been on set yeah, with that. Yeah, right. And it's funny because, you know, cinematically, what yeah, it was great. Add is yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> but if you can get yeah. there without torturing people, it's also, you yeah. know, it's also and mostly on something where they're like, hey, like this is a this is a procedural. We it's it, you're not actually driving the plot at all. Like, you know, like Leonardo DiCaprio in that movie, he couldn't have been in a cabin the whole time. It wouldn't have had anything, you know, but mm -hmm. we can. We don't need to hack actually we can say like it's coming down hard out there and then show a stock image. Like they're like, that's probably the way to go. But it's also hard, you know, you've got night shoots in L.A. where suddenly the temperature drops and everybody's mm -hmm. in winter coats and you're like, oh, shit. So, you know, it's you always see like the second the yell cut, like 10 people run over with coats for the actors. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, yeah, they're freezing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, too, um, as a writer, director that um, and now also maybe producer, I noticed on the containing Charlie, your list is one of the producers. How do you just in general feel about, you know, the bureaucracy that is television writing. Um, and as I, I told you before the interview, I've done no TV work at all, but I have been hired to write some scripts and it always makes me feel more like a craftsman or maybe a mechanic as opposed to an artist. The projects where I've written, directed and produced are vastly different just on a creative fulfillment scale. Um, but how do you deal with that? Because it sounds very bureaucratic in the TV writing. You know, you're getting notes from a lot of people um, that you may not even really agree with, but you're ultimately being paid to, to implement them. I think that's the, was probably one of the hardest lessons for me to learn because I do come from the indie world and I come from the world where I write it and people go, oh, that's good. And we go with it, you know, and I'm, I have the final say. And I do think that was one of, I remember having like a breakdown and crying my eyes out. And cause I got a scene got completely rewritten and I felt, and it wasn't that I was like insulted. I felt stupid. I was like, oh, I missed the mark. And this wonderful writer, Scott Williams brought me in his office, shut the door and was like, cry it out, get it out of your system. And he was like, every single person on TV is rewritten. He was like, it is not your show. It's the showrunner show. And he was like, one day, You'll have your own show and you're going to hire somebody and they're going to write something and you're going to go, oh, I get where they were going with, but like the show, it needs to be a little bit more like this. He's like, and that person's going to probably go in an office and cry. Mm -hmm. He's like, because it, it, like we all, you have a moment where you go like, wait, no, I did that well. And then you have a moment of going like, oh, am I an imposter? Like that's 
that's the worst part is when you go like, oh, I thought I, I thought I did what needed to be done. And then it, it's not, but it's also, it was realizing that like, no matter what, I'm not in this person's head. And it is their, like the showrunner runs the, the direction of the characters and the storylines. Like that's their job. Mm-hmm. So like, and they have a different idea, even if it's just like a tweak of something of a different direction, a character would go in and it's a very hard thing to realize. And I think a lot of mostly lately I've been doing, cause I'm not working at the moment. I'll do notes for money. Cause I'm like a hooker. Like I need, <laughs> I need to do some work. Uh, and one of the most fascinating things that I find is when people go, I go, well, Hey, like with this scene, you know, what might be neat. And they'll go, no, 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 no. And they're like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to change anything. And I always go like, you're, this is a television pilot. Like learn to change like it's the the greatest realization is to say like because then i'm very lucky in ncis that we got to go produce our own episodes so we got to be on set Mm -hmm. which a lot of tv shows you don't even get to do that and but you go down there with a script and like at this point everybody's like okay we can shoot this which is you're like thank god we found something you're like it's not exactly what i wrote it's got the same kind of idea of what I wrote. You're like, but we're going to do this. And then you get on set and you'll hear an actor say a line. And the worst part is when you go like, oh God, like I wrote that. And that sounds, you know, it just sounds terrible coming out of their mouths. Mm -hmm. Or they look at you and go like, I don't know if I would say this. And your first instinct is to have a panic attack because some famous actor is looking at you going like, what do you mean by this? And you suddenly have no idea what you meant by it. Like no matter how many times Mm -hmm. they would ask me like, hey, what does this mean? I'd be like, I don't even know what you're talking. Like, it's like you just draw a blank like instantly Mm -hmm. because it's an environment you're not used to you're not used to having conversations with like i was not used to speaking to mark Harmon about his his acting like or like his production of an episode like i that was completely new to me um and then you hear it there and you go oh it, it doesn't really work and then the actors put their inflection on things and then the director puts their inflection on things and I mean, in film school, they say there's like the, you know, the thing you write, the thing you produce and the thing that you get at the end. Like there's three different movies, there's three different projects completely. Mm -hmm. And I think when you can't budge is when you can't work because it is a collaborative medium. It Mm -hmm. is a like you'll get on set and we had a scene where it was really wordy. I'd written a shit ton of dialogue and the actress you could just tell she wasn't feeling it. And it's, and the director was like, something's off. And I was like, I think it's just too wordy. And he took some of it out. And together we were all like, shit, this works better, flows better. But the minute you go, like, I think it was Phoebe Waller Bridge who said like, it's a, the screenplay is an, is a blueprint or something. And ple- people freaked out because they were like, it's not a blueprint. It's exactly what you're doing. And it's like, no, it it mm-hmm. isn't. And if you walk onto a TV set, you know, if you're writing a feature, you've got the chance that you can do that. But if you're on a TV set and you're like, no, it has to be this, like you're just writing your own ticket out of there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what are you working on now? I noticed on IMDb, um, as I said, you had this containing Charlie is is listed as being in development. Um, but what what are you doing now with your, with your career and what are you trying to push forward? Yeah, Charlie's been in development for probably 10 years. Um, that's my baby that we always say, like, I, I'll get it done one day. It might be in the next five years, it might be in the next 50, but like one day that will get made. Um, it's just the indie film world is, you know, it's, it's brutal and it's hard to raise the money and then the costs of everything keeps going up. So what we were trying to make for, you know, a hundred, couple hundred grand 10 years ago is now 800 grand at this point. Cause the cost of everything's changed. It's just, a, that's a wild world. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also writing a feature with a producer. Um, we came up with, a, with an idea together over the summer and I've been writing that. I've been writing two TV pilots. I, before I left NCIS, I just gotten my first agent who's fantastic. And I was with a new manager for the last couple of years. And um, it really is finding the the right team to work with that really matters. When I was looking for a new manager. It was right in the beginning of COVID and I was querying people and I queried a lot of people and I got about 12 or 13, like, yes, we'll read your work messages. And a couple of them were like, Hey, we want to meet with you. And it was all zoom obviously. And most of them were like, this stuff's great. We're going to hit the ground running. Like, can't wait to work with you. And that, that was what one person said. Then the next person was like, we love everything you've written. And I was feeling so high And then I met with this gentleman and he was like, you have really good work. And I think we can make this great. 
And I remember be, in my head going like, wait, what? Like everybody else is blowing smoke up my ass, but you're not. And he was like, well, like, let's talk about where we want to, where you want to take your career. And I was like, oh shit, you actually want to cultivate a career for me. And we're looking at the long run. And the most important thing I think to do when you get in this industry is realize that it is a long game. Mm -hmm. You are always playing the long game. If you are waiting to break in in six months, just go home. Cause mm -hmm. you're going to just make yourself miserable and you're going to go home in six months anyway. Like if you have to be willing to say, well, I hope in 10 years I can do this. And if you can do that, then you can find people who are willing to help you and, you know, work with you. And he's been phenomenal. So now that I have him and an agent who's amazing, it's been great because we're kind of, I have this like tag team group working for me, which has been awesome. So now we're now that I left the show, I've had so much time to work. I left in July. So I've been writing, you know, I've rewrote a pilot from that we liked, but that just wasn't, you know, hitting all the marks. And then I wrote a new pilot and then I have this feature. And the goal is when January hits and, you know, the the industry comes back from the two month hiatus, it feels mm -hmm. like it goes on that we'll have fresh material to go out with. And I've been taking a lot of meetings and that's the hope is to, you know, sell something, get staffed in something, get just even get in development with somebody or just make those connections. Cause it's mm -hmm. just kind of working the long game. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I just like to wrap up the interviews by asking the guests, is there anything you've seen recently, Netflix, Hulu, HBO that you can recommend maybe something a little below the radar, but really anything you've been watching that you think a writing audience could, could get some value out of. Yeah. Um, I know that everybody's probably said the bear on Hulu. I feel like that's everybody's uh, out here's thing right now, because, but I think the interesting thing to watch the bear for as a writer is since the bear came out, which is a 30 minute, I don't even know what I, I guess dramedy. I don't even know what category you'd put it in, but it's definitely not a straight comedy. And ever since that came out, I'd say half of the meetings I've taken, people have gone, okay, so that's an hour long dramedy that you have. And I say, yes. And they go, have you ever thought about making it a half hour? because they've huh. seen that it yeah. works and it works. Even if you look at like a hacks, you know, hacks on HBO, it's like hacks is like 30 some minutes, you know, it's kind of ebbs and flows in that world, but it's comedy, but it's also a lot of heart and a lot of drama. And I think, I just feel like the 30 minute is kind of what people are leaning towards a little bit more. So I think it's always good to have one of those in your back pocket. And I think the bear is a really good example. Um, I'm also obsessed with um, outer range. Hmm. which I believe is on prime. Um, and it's written by a playwright. I think it's very interesting because it's allowed a lot of freedom to be a very slow burn, but it's just a very beautiful Western meets sci-fi, which I never thought would be hmm. either of those would be my thing. Um, and it just works really well. But if you want to study some dialogue, that show, because it's written by a playwright where the, you know, mm -hmm. the words are allowed to be a little flowery, but they come off, when you put those in the mouth of like a cowboy, you're like, oh shit, that works. Yeah. So I think those are the two that I've been like studying lately and gotcha. watching and going like, this is fascinating. Yeah. 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 Those are great recommendations. What's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? I will put these in the show notes, Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing Instagram. I guess Twitter is, um, I have to always have to look up what my Twitter name is. It's funny as a writer, I legitimately put my name in. They were like, well, some, but there already is a Katie white. And I was like, okay. They're like, but there's no, <laughs> KDW552. And I was like, whatever. So that's what I am. It's at okay. KDW552. And people are like, what does it mean? I'm like, it means that's what automatically came up. And I just went with it. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. I'll round that up for the show notes. And we link to your IMDb Great. page as well. So people can see that. Katie, I appreciate you coming on talking with me. Good luck with your rest of your career. And I look forward to having you back on when you get some of these features done. Thank you. This was so much fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. SYS's From Concept to Completion screenwriting course is now available. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash screenwriting course. It will take you through every part of writing a screenplay, coming up with a concept, outlining, writing the opening pages, the first act, second act, third act, and then rewriting. And then there's even a module at the end on marketing your screenplay once it's polished and ready to be sent out. We're offering this course in two different versions. The first version, you get the course, plus you get three analyses from an SYS reader. You'll get one analysis on your outline, and then you'll get two analyses on your 
first draft of your screenplay. This is just our introductory price. You're getting three full analyses, which is actually the same price as our three pack analysis bundle. So you're essentially getting the course for free when you buy the three analyses that come with it. And to be clear, you're getting our full analysis with this package. The other version doesn't have the analysis. So you'll have to find some friends or colleagues who will do the feedback portion of the course with you. I'm letting SYS select members do this version of the course for free. So so if you're a member of SYS Select, you already have access to it. You also might consider that as an option. If you join SYS Select, you will get the course as part of that membership too. A big piece of this course is accountability. Once you start the course, you'll get an email every Sunday with that week's assignment. And if you don't complete it, we'll follow up with another reminder the next week. It's easy to pause the course if you need to take some time off, but as long as you're enrolled, you'll continue to get reminders for each section until it's completed. The objective of the course is to get you through it in six months so that you have a completed, polished screenplay ready to be sent out. So if you have an idea for a screenplay and you're having a hard time getting it done, this course might be exactly what you need. If this sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash screenwriting course. It's all one word, all lowercase. I will, of course, link to the course in the show notes, and I will put a link to the course on the homepage up in the right-hand sidebar. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing producer and director Roxanne Benjamin. She just directed a horror film called There's Something Wrong with the Children, but she got her start really just as a film, as a horror film fan, going to film festivals, networking, meeting people, um, and eventually getting a job in the business, not as a writer or producer, just kind of a low level job, but using this experience with um, film festivals and her network of, of horror filmmakers. Um, she landed this job at a production company. Eventually, she helped produce the horror film VHS, um, which was a very successful found footage film. We've even had one of the writers, it was a, um, you know, they took a bunch of different film filmmakers and let them do kind of a small little horror short and then there was sort of an overarching story that they were all under. Um, it's a very interesting film. I think it's still available on Netflix and, and Hulu and that sort of thing. So de I definitely would um, recommend checking it out. Um, again, if you're, if you're doing low budget found footage films, VHS is really a great example of one of those. Um, so that's how she got her start and then she was able to parlay that into um, you know directing, producing and directing some other films. Um, so now she's got a new one coming out out that's called There's Something Wrong with the Children. So we'll talk about that and then also talk about VHS and kind of how she got her start in the business and worked her way up. Very transparent and really, as I said, she gives some really great detail into how she's been able to produce and direct so many films in her career. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's the show. Thank you for listening.